thank you for joining me for the second part of the Zadok Priestly calendar in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about the Torah and how this calendar is in the Torah. In the first part, we talked about the solar calendar being depicted in Scripture, which is amazing. Now we're going to talk about how the calendar functions from year to year. One thing that we have to keep in mind is that the creation week is supreme. It is the precedent that was established in the very beginning. Day one, we saw let there be light. And this was a division of light and dark that occurred on day one. I believe that's a depiction of an equinox on day one. Day two was the creation of the heavens. And day three was the creation of the earth. Now day two wasn't tobe, it wasn't good. It wasn't until the heavens and the earth were both created on day three that it was good. On day four, we see the creation of time. This is the first month of the first year. How is time calculated? Through the use of the sun, the moon, and the stars. So until we had the sun, the moon, and the stars placed in the heavens on the fourth day, time just didn't exist, not as we know it today. So day four is the beginning of time. It was the start of the first year, of the first calendar in the Torah. Day five, we see the creation of the sea creatures and the birds. Day six, there was the creation of beasts of the earth. Adam and Eve were created and the Garden of Eden was created. And day seven was the seventh day Sabbath. Now, if you notice that from the day, the first day of the first month, which is on day four of creation, if you count day four, five, six, and seven, you will see that day seven, the seventh day Sabbath is on the fourth day day of the month. If you'll recall that in the first cycle of the spring season, in the first month, the first Sabbath day is always on day four. This is why. Because in the story of creation, the Sabbath occurred four days after time began. So Abib 1, or New Year's Day, must always fall on the fourth day of the week. The seasons or renewals of the 13-week cycle must always begin on the fourth day of the week as well. The first Sabbath of the first year and each season must occur on the fourth day of the new month. If you'll recall, in our previous slide, we saw that month one, which is the first month of spring, month four, which is the first month of summer, month seven, which is the first month of fall, and month 10, which is the first month of winter, all of the Sabbaths match, and they all begin on the fourth day of that month. Now, let's talk about intercalary days in the Book of Enoch and why we have intercalary days. Why is there a 31st day at the end of every third month preceding the start of the next season. So, if we look here on the diagram, you will see that this is a year starting with the spring. You'll see the chart on the, the right-hand side. It says spring going down into summer. You'll see there's three months. So we have month one, which began on Wednesday, the fourth day of the week. Month two begins on Friday, which is the sixth day of the week and month three began on Sunday. If we do not include that 31st intercalary day, our first day of summer, of the summer season, would begin on Tuesday, not on Wednesday. This is why the 31st day must be included with the third month in order to keep the first day of the next season cycle on Wednesday, the fourth day. Remember the fourth day of creation when time began. 
Now here we see summer. There's our intercalary day, our 31st day, which occurs on the third day of the week, which in modern times we call Tuesday. That 31st day moves the first day of summer to the correct place, Wednesday. And you'll see that four days later, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Shabbat. The fourth day is the Sabbath. Now, we go through the season of summer. So we've got month four, month five, and month six. At the end of month six, we have another 31st intercalary day. The reason again is to keep the next season of fall from beginning on the wrong day. It has to begin on the fourth day of the week, which is Wednesday. Now we see the months of fall when we have our intercalary day in the beginning. Our first day of fall falls on Wednesday. The first day of the seventh month falls on Wednesday. Then the eighth month is on Friday. The ninth month is on Sunday. And we come to the end of that month and without the intercalary day, our season of winter would shift. We can't allow that. So we have a 31st intercalary day to make sure that the seasons all begin on the fourth day of the week when time began. Here we see a 31st intercalary day, which keeps it on Wednesday. And then of course, the 11th month begins on Friday. And the 12th month begins on Sunday. Now I've switched in this view to counting the literal days. So you'll see at the very end, the four intercalary days. You'll see 358, 359, 360th day. The 360th day always lands on Friday, always. Then you have your four intercalary days. Why do we add four intercalary days to the base number 360? In order to get back to the fourth day of the week, Wednesday. That is the purpose of the intercalary days. 361 is on Shabbat. 362 is on the first day of the week. 363 is the second day of the week. 364 is on the third day of the week, making year two begin once again on the fourth day of the week. This is why we have intercalary days, to keep your years and your weeks within the years from ever shifting days. That is the whole focus of intercalary days. Now look what happens if we don't add the intercalary days. Here's a diagram without the intercalary days. When you get to the end of your spring season, when you get to the end of the third month, if you do not add a 31st day, the first day of summer would land on the third day of the week. It would move forward one day. Now, if it moves forward one day on that Tuesday, the fourth day, your Shabbat, would actually occur on Friday, not on Shabbat. Then you can see how the days continue to shift into the fourth, the fifth month, and then into the sixth month. And then when you begin fall, now your, your season begins on Monday instead of Wednesday. So it moved back one day for summer, now it's moved back one day for, for fall to Monday. And look what would happen. Your Shabbat, the fourth day of the month, would fall on Thursday. Now you see there's the shifting from season one, the fourth day being on Shabbat, the seventh day, to season two, the summer, now your Shabbat is on Friday, the sixth day. So you've not worked six days and rested the seventh, you've worked five days and you're resting the sixth. And then you move forward to the next season, fall, and your Shabbat shifts once again and now it's on the fifth day or Thursday in our modern times. So the purpose of the intercalary days is to keep the Sabbaths, the new years and the seasons from ever shifting weekdays, ever. 
Enoch tells us that the four intercalary days are inseparable from their office. Understand days. And owing to them, the intercalary days, men go wrong therein. And the exactness of the year is accomplished through its separate 364 stations, i.e. days. You cannot separate those intercalary days from the third day of the week. They are always the third day of the week. So if you are following a calendar that shifts your days of the week, including your seventh day Sabbath, from season to season or from year to year, then you are unfortunately erring according to the witness of the Torah and the Zadok priests and Enoch one. It is impossible to shift the Sabbath day and to keep the Sabbath commandment holy. For in six days Yah made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore Yah blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus 20:11. Work shall be done for six days, not five, not four. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, holy to Yahweh. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. That's in Exodus 31, 15. So any shifting of the Sabbath day from year to year will cause less days or more days until the next Sabbath, breaking the cycle of creation. As I showed you just a few minutes ago, if you shifted your Sabbath, you were resting, or you were working rather, for five days and then resting on the sixth day and calling it the Sabbath and then starting a seven day cycle from there. Now you've broken the, the Sabbath cycle. You cannot do that. The reason this occurs is because many people use the book of Enoch 1 as the sole authority on the biblical calendar. However, Enoch 1 was written after the creation week cycle had already been established. It builds upon established precedent. And we see that if you follow the calendar correctly from the fourth day of creation week, you will never shift your Sabbath day from season to season or from year to year. You cannot break the eternal cycle. If you began following Yah's biblical calendar from the fourth day of creation, when time began, you would never see the seventh day Sabbath shift days ever. It is perfect. It is unchanging. It is a calculated calendar based on the number seven, which we first see in the seven days of creation. Seven is a holy, sacred unit of time. And Yah uses it in the scripture to establish the seventh day Sabbath and to establish feast days. We saw that with Shavuot. The Shemitah years, every seventh year, the land remains fallow, you don't plant. And the Jubilee years, when the land returns to its rightful owners. So the 364 day year conforms to the sacred seven day weekly cycle as established at creation, the precedent, and the seven day week does not shift to conform to the 364 day year. And I think that's where some people are erring is that they're wanting to shift their weeks to conform to a 364 day year. But the reality is that your 364 day year must conform to the seven day weekly cycle because precedent builds upon precedent. Now the sign of the vernal equinox. Then Elohim said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Genesis 1.14. Signs or oat. That's Hebrews 2.26. If you want to look that up, it means a sign or a signal. The root word is uth and that is 2.25 in your strongs. And that means to come, to consent, or agree. So the vernal equinox requires the star, sun, and the moon working together 
to produce equal day and equal night. We went over that in part one. So the stars complete a 360 degree circle and the sun rises in nearly the same place in the constellations as it did a year earlier. Now we talked about the precession of the equinoxes and how the equinox moves forward one day every year or two days every four years. So this is why when it, when it rises during the vernal equinox and, and they mark where it is in the constellations, it's not precisely where it was the year before. It's always moving forward. And in 72 years, the equinox actually moves forward one full degree in the 360 degree constellation cycle. And then the moon pauses to set in the same gate as the sun two times per year. The sun does nothing different. It's the moon that pauses and sets with the sun and that is what creates equal day equal night. This is what the scriptures call a sign, a signal or an agreement or consent to indicate that the next year may begin. Now, we're talking not about this is when the new year begins. It's a signal, a consent, or an agreement based on your calculation that now the new year may begin. Because the equinox may fall on the first day of the week, or it might fall on a Monday or a Tuesday, but that cannot shift your year. It cannot shift your Sabbaths. It cannot shift your, week, your, your feast days. Now, I want to add a quick note here that um, nowhere in Genesis 1.14 are there any earth signs given for determining the new year, such as the barley being ripe. That is not in Torah, that is not in the precedent of what is used to establish when a year can begin. That is the sun, the moon, and the stars. There are no earth signs in Genesis 1.14. That is a doctrine of man that is not found in the precedent given in Genesis chapter 1. So again, observation is not how y'all's calendar is designed to be followed. Observation is only for consent or agreement from the three witnesses, the sun, the moon, and the stars at the equinox that tells you, yes, when your 364 days is up, you may begin the next year on that Wednesday following the vernal equinox. Now, what the vernal equinox does not do. The vernal equinox does not occur exactly 364 days from the vernal equinox of the previous year. We just talked about that. The vernal equinox occurs 365 or 366 days from the previous vernal equinox. The vernal equinox does not establish the first day of the new year or a B1, either on the equinox itself or on the day immediately following it. Now, I know that in Enoch, he gives us the equinox on the third day. I understand that. But you also must understand that there are parts of Enoch 1 that are missing. They have been found, some parts of it have been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that were not in Enoch 1. And there are missing parts of it. And like I said, in the story of creation on day one, we see a division of night and day. That is also an equinox. So you have an equinox in Torah on Sunday, and you have an equinox in Enoch on Tuesday. That's because the equinox moves. It moves every year. It shifts forward one or two days. Now, the vernal equinox is a signal. It's an agreement or a consent, a witness, that the new year, Abib 1, may be declared after the 364th day of the current year has concluded. It doesn't matter if the equinox occurs on day 362. You cannot begin your new year on the next day because you would have only worked three, four, five days and then rested on the sixth day. And that violates the commandment. He gave us a precedent. Six days, you can work. The seventh is the Shabbat. Any attempts to use the equinox signal as the definitive start of the next year, one, annuls the seven-day weekly cycle of creation. Again, you're working four or five days and you're resting on the sixth day. 
it violates the fourth commandment. And it shifts the seventh day Sabbath each year. So here is an example of an equinox occurring on the 361st day. This is in um, 2016, actually. I, I was going to use 1999 and 2000, but I decided to go with more current years. So in 2016, the equinox fell on March 19th, which was the seventh day, the, the Sabbath. However, the first day of the year did not begin until the fourth day of the week. So you can see day 361 is when the equinox occurs. You've got to finish out your calculation, 362, 363, 364, and on the fourth day is the first day of the next year. It is impossible to follow the vernal equinox to establish years unless you disregard the seven day weekly cycle completely. In 2017, the equinox fell on March 20, and on the first day of the week, and that's actually day 362. So in the first, on the top diagram, it's day 361. The bottom diagram, it lands on day 362, 363, 364, and here you have your fourth day. This is why that you see some Enoch calendars are observing their seventh day Sabbath this year on a Thursday, which for them is the fourth day following the equinox, which it is. It is the fourth day following the equinox. Um, however, Enoch 1 says, and owing to them, the intercalary days, men go wrong therein. There's a myriad of different ways to go wrong if you don't understand the intercalary days. So here in 2017, so the equinox is on Monday. Monday is day one, Tuesday is day two, Wednesday is day three because it shifted, and the fifth day is now why they are keeping the Sabbath on the fourth day, which is actually our Thursdays. And I know, <laughs> heads are spinning in 360 degree circles right now. But honestly, it's not my intention to offend any of my brothers and sisters um, who believe differently than I do. Um, I sincerely disagree with you, and you can sincerely disagree with me, um, but let's remember we're still brothers and sisters. The correct weekly cycle has not been lost. Yes, I have read the evidence put forth by my Enoch calendar friends and my lunar calendar friends purporting to show that we cannot trust the seven-day weekly cycle that we currently follow. Yes, I've seen it. I've been bombarded with it at times. However, I unequivocally disagree. Please, though, don't let this divide between brothers and sisters. We are all brothers and sisters in Yeshua, and we share much more in common than we disagree over. Why I disagree and still love you the evidence of changed dates does nothing to change the weekly cycle of Sunday through Saturday. Changing a Monday, for example, from the 2nd to the 14th does not add an extra Monday or an extra Tuesday. The following days are still Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, etc. The week is unbroken regardless of what date you apply over the top of the weekday. There is zero evidence that the Jewish communities around the world switched days or were confused when far-reaching nations made short-lived attempts to adopt a different weekly cycle, or that even Rome itself became confused when, say, Australia or some other nation attempted a different calendar for a brief period of time. The evidence shows that the rest of the nations all joined back with the long-standing Gregorian calendar by this last century. Before that, the Julian calendar was implemented in 45 BCE by Rome. The days and the weeks simply have not changed in the past 2,063 years. I find no evidence for that. So what about when the Zadok priests were observing the Sabbath day? There is a document in the Dead Sea Scrolls called 4Q320. It is a reconciled lunar and solar calendar with specific days of the week when full moons occurred. Through a great deal of personal research, 
I discovered that the luminary calendar provided by 4Q320, which documents 2,300 years ago, three years in a row, is an exact match to our modern day weekly cycle between 2013 and 2018. Exact match. Anyone who understands the Zadok Priestly calendar can do as I've done and reconcile our modern week with 4Q320. However, this will not work if you follow a shifting calendar. It can only be reconciled using our current seven day weekly cycle. Now, in this diagram, I'd like you to see that this is 2013 Gregorian on the right side and 2013 Enoch calendar on the left side. And I just want you to note where the full moons are occurring. So on Enoch, you've got the first day of the year, there's a full moon on Wednesday, the fourth day. And on the Gregorian calendar, that correlates to the 27th day of March. You've got a full moon. Now you move down to the 30th day on the Enoch calendar, you have a full moon, which correlates to the Gregorian calendar, the 25th day. Notice that it is on a Thursday. And then move on down, you see that the next full moon occurs on the 30th day of Hakos, and that is the 25th day of May. And the next full moon occurs on Sunday, the first day of the week, and you'll see that the 23rd day of June. And like I said, I've got six years of reconciled Gregorian to Enoch. The days of the week are the same. Now, this is what 4Q320 actually talks about, which is the lunar cycle and the solar Enoch cycle. And it starts with, to show it from the east and to cause it to shine in the middle of heaven, in the foundation of creation, from evening till morning. Now, this is talking about the moon, because the sun does not shine from evening until morning. Only the moon does, and this is a full moon. On the fourth day of the week of the sons of Gamal in the first month of the first year. Now, if you would look on the right side of the screen where it says 2013 Enoch, if at the very top line it says for Gamal. Okay, so the fourth day of Gamal is that Wednesday. That correlates to the day before the first day on the lunar calendar. Now, if you go down to the next one in gold, you'll see that that is Yadaya. And Yadaya, it says five Yadaya. That is the fifth day. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, fifth day in the order of Yadaya. So Yadaya would have come in on the, on the Shabbat. All of the priestly orders start on Shabbat. And that would be considered seven Yadaya, the seventh day, Yadaya. Then you've got one Yadaya Sunday, two Yadaya Monday, three Yadaya Tuesday, four Yadaya would be Wednesday, five Yadaya is Thursday, and the last day of Yadaya service would have been on Friday. But you see where you have the full moon right there on the fifth day of Yadaya, which is the very next line. On the fifth day, in the week of Yadaya, corresponding to the 29th day, see where the gold, the 29th day on the lunar calendar on the left, which falls on the 30th day of the solar month. So under the Enoch calendar, that is the 30th day. The next line, on the Sabbath in the week of Hakoz, that's in the purple, the 30th day of the lunar month, which falls on the 30th day of the solar month. Note that the purple boxes match, 30th day, 30th day, and it is on the seventh day, the Shabbat. That's why it says seven hakos. Now to the next one, and on the first day in the week of Eliashib, which is the 29th day of the lunar month, see where the full moon is on the left side of the screen, the 29th day, which is the 29th day of the solar month. See where it is on day one, one Eliashib, 
the 29th day of month three. Now, Jerry Morris and I have six years of perfectly reconciled solar, lunar, and Gregorian calendars, which we compiled separately before we ever met, which shows that the weekly cycle from 2,300 years ago, as recorded in the Dead Sea Scrolls, precisely matches our modern day weekly cycle of Sunday through Saturday. The seven day weekly cycle was never lost. It has never changed, at least not since the Dead Sea Scrolls were compiled and this reconciled calendar was given to us. Now, there's another question that I get frequently. Why is there confusion over when the vernal equinox actually occurs? The confusion lies in not understanding how modern day observatories record data for sunrise and sunset times. For example, if you look at timeanddate.com or the Farm Farmer's Almanac, which I personally prefer, to view the lengths of day and night, you will see an apparent discrepancy, generally between the 16th of March and the 20th of March. This occurs because the times recorded are from the moment the top of the circle of the sun touches the horizon for the sunrise time, and when the bottom circle of the sun touches the horizon for the sunset time. The Dead Sea Scrolls indicate that the sun is viewed from the center or the diameter of the sun on the horizon, not from the top or from the bottom, which only makes sense if you want to get an exact measurement. This creates about an eight minute difference, plus four minutes to sunrise and sunset times. So while March 16 looks like it has equal day and equal night based on sunrise sunset times, it's still actually approximately eight minutes off. And March 20 will appear to be eight minutes off when it is actually equal day and equal night. Now, the feast days and the Sabbaths in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are seven biblical feasts, all occur within the first seven months. Shavuot occurs in the third month. However, its precise date is established in the first month by calculating seven sevens plus one day. So seven times seven equals 49 plus one day equals the 50th day, which begins at first fruits. The dates in the Dead Sea Scrolls are given specifically by the Zadok priests. Abib 1 is New Year's Day, the fourth day of the week, every time. The 14th day of the first month is Passover. The 15th of the 21st is Unleavened Bread. A notable difference is that first fruits always begins on the 26th day of the first month. So when the full seven days of unleavened bread and Passover are completed, following the next Sabbath, the first day of the week is first fruits or the waving of the sheaf offering. The 15th day of the third month is Shavuot. The first day of the seventh month is trumpets or the memorial of the blowing of the shofar. The 10th day of the seventh month is a day of atonement and the 15th of the 21st of the seventh month is Sukkot, and then there's the eighth day of Sukkot, which is called addition. All of these are laid out very specifically in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So how do we know when the new year begins? While the calendar may seem complex, this part is actually very simple. The first Wednesday following the vernal equinox is always going to be a beep one, every time very simple way to look at your calendar and know when the first day of the year will occur. Now, there is some debate on the issue of intercalating because everyone knows that we have to intercalate on this calendar in order to keep our seasons with the first month. And in an agricultural society, it would be very important to have a calendar that keeps you ex precisely within your planting and your harvesting seasons. Now we know that the vernal equinox moves forward one day each year and two days every four years on average. 
This is how I believe we intercalate based on my understanding today, if you look at this diagram. So we look at our diagram here. 2017, the equinox is on the 20th of March, the second day of the week, that's on Monday. In 2018, it's going to fall on Tuesday, the third day of the week. In 2019, it's actually going to fall on the fourth day of the week, which should be a B1. However, we don't have our sign or our agreement before the 364th day is completed. We haven't had it. If you declared the 20th of March 2019 to be a B1, you would have to declare it halfway through the day because you wouldn't actually be able to see the equinox occurring until halfway through the day, until it's half over. So this, I believe, is our indicator on how to intercalate a full seven days in order to keep our weeks from shifting. You must add seven full days and begin a B1 the following Wednesday. This occurs every five to six years. A seven day intercalation will be required in 2019 and again six years later in 2025. Sometimes it's five years, depending on um, if you have one or two where the leap year falls, where, the, where it jumps forward, you know, if the 366th day, it adds two days, so it jumps forward two days. Depending on that, where that falls, sometimes it'll happen on five years rather than six years. So the year would look something like this. A B1 beginning on what would have been the eighth day of the new year. And I agree with John and Donna Minton that the regular priests would come in on the 361st day, which is the 28th day, the 12th month, and they would work for their normal first four days. Then all of the priestly courses would work the seven intercalary days as they always did on Unleavened Bread and Sukkot. And then the regular order would finish out their final three days. So they would come in on the 361st day, and for each of those blue boxes, they would work one, two, three, four days. All of the priests would come in on the first day, and they would work for seven days, which would end on the third day of the week, on Tuesday. And then the priestly order would pick up their final three days, first, second, third day of the new year. That would keep your weeks from ever shifting, and it would also keep your priestly orders from ever shifting. Remember, your priestly orders cannot shift and neither can your seven day week. So without intercalating a full seven days, a B1 would quickly move away from the vernal equinox as it would occur at first one day later than a B1 and then within six years, it would occur a full week after a B1. We're talking about the vernal equinox now. The vernal equinox would occur a week after the first day of the year began. And within 24 years, the vernal equinox would occur a month after you declared a B1 the first month of the year. This would be unimaginable in an agricultural society dependent upon its planting, harvesting, and livestock. The biblical calendar actually keeps the new year and the agricultural calendar as closely aligned with the seasons as possible. In fact, this calendar is far superior to any other calendar system for an agricultural cycle. Also, without intercalating a full seven days, the weekly cycle would shift and the priestly orders would quickly fall into chaos. Both of which we know, due to the Dead Sea Scrolls, never occurs if followed correctly. One final reason I believe that we intercalate a full seven days when the equinox occurs on what should be the first day of the year or passes what should be a B1 is in 4Q326 in calendrical document C. We read in the first month on the fourth day is a Sabbath. On the eighth day in it is Sabbath. That's what it says in the English translation, but if you read it from the scroll in Hebrew, it says on the eighth day in it is a moed, an appointed time. 
The literal word used in the scroll is moed, appointed time, not the Sabbath. I believe that this may indicate that the first of the year, Abib 1, sometimes occurs on the eighth day due to intercalating a full seven-day week when the oat, the sign, the agreement, the vernal equinox, hasn't occurred. It also indicates that the regular weekly Sabbath is not to be ignored during this period, but it is still to be observed. Again, the fourth commandment to only work six days and rest on the seventh day cannot be broken. I'd also like to note that this line is missing in some of the newer translations where it says on the eighth day in it is Sabbath. That is missing in some of the newer translations. You may have to go and pull up photocopies of the literal scrolls in order to see it, um, depending on what version of the Dead Sea Scrolls that you have. So does this calendar line up with the canonized scriptures? Yes, it does. It lines up perfectly with the Exodus dates, as well as with Daniel's prophecies, the flood account, and those given in the writings and the prophets. It also appears that Yeshua and the disciples were following this calendar in the New Testament account. Now, the Zadok priests in the Dead Sea Scrolls called those who followed the biblical calendar the sons of light and children of light. They exhorted the people to walk in righteousness and to walk in the light and not in darkness. The concept of light and dark are a consistent theme throughout the New Testament books. Read here in John 12, 36, while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. These things Yeshua spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Again, in 1 Thessalonians 5.5, 5, You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Isn't that great news? In Luke 16.8, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. That's not a good thing. And in Ephesians Chapter 5, verse 8. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in Yahweh. Walk as children of light. Sons of light, children of light, specific terminology directly found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I just want to thank you for watching this study. Regardless of what your opinions are, I appreciate the time that you've taken to finish this entire study with me and provide any comments or questions in the spirit of love and compassion as brothers and sisters in Yeshua ought to always do. Thank you again and Shalom.